Good afternoon, my friends. The doctor is in the house. Welcome back to another episode of To Your Health with Dr. G on this great, somewhat cold outside Wednesday. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. My name is Dr. Mark Gomez, board certified internal medicine physician practicing out of Edward Hospital. I am so excited today to welcome you guys back to my show. And I tell you what, I say it all the time, but I really mean it this time. My panel today is fierce. Now, every panel has been fierce in the past, don't get me wrong, but today I am so excited because all the guests that you guys are going to meet today, they are not only just the consummate professionals, they're amazing at their craft, but I consider them all very good friends of mine. And again, it takes a village when we're talking about improving your health and uplifting each other. You know, you have to surround yourself with people that have your back. And there's no doubt that these individuals today certainly have mine. So I'm so excited to welcome just. I mean, I tell you what, when I thought of this topic, I go, okay, I know exactly who I need to have on the show. And it's something that we got to talk about more, my anesthesiologist. So I'm excited to welcome everybody back to my show. Today's show is entitled Anesthesiology, Not Just Putting You to Sleep. And I think that's an important thing because the reality is when we think of anesthesiologists, we think of it just more like uh, the doctor that's going to put you to sleep. They're kind of hovering over you with a mask or say, here's some medicine before you're about to have surgery. Or that doctor is the doctor that when you're in a stressful situation, it's time to give birth, get your epidural. But anesthesiologists do so much more. Yes, they do those things. Don't get me wrong. Make no mistake. But they do so much more. And I consider anesthesiologists such critical members of anyone's healthcare team. Now, the reality is that most of us will come into contact with an anesthesiologist at some point in our lives. We're not trying to avoid you guys, though, you know. But the anesthesiologists, the reality is that we're going to come to anesthesiologists in our lives. So why not better understand what they do? Because it's much more complex than what we think of on the surface. So I'm excited to welcome my group of anesthesiologists today. We're going to dive into this in a little bit. You're listening here live on Intellectual Radio. Check me out on my website, www.drmarkgomez.com. You know my handle on social media, at to your health, DRG. Hey, I'm so excited to have everybody back here. We're just going to keep this content going. You know, we've been bringing you guys shows for a long time now, and I'm almost at my one-year anniversary of doing To Your Health with Dr. G. And the purpose of this show, in each and every episode, is to continue to build trust and deliver truth when it comes to health. So I'm so excited to welcome everybody. Before we meet the guests, you know, i got to read a quick disclaimer. Here we go. <clears throat> The content of To Your Health with Dr. G is for informational and entertainment purposes only, and that the content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, and or treatment. Further details can be found at www.toyourhealthwithdrg.com slash disclaimer. So here we are today, continuing this health journey together. And I want you to, want you to basically find those people in your lives Get everybody to listen to this. We're starting this movement. We're actually not starting. We're continuing this movement, this momentum of health engagement and make sure people have the best resources. And part of that engagement is eliminating, eliminating disparities, dispelling myths when it comes to medical care. We understand that medical care and health is complex, but this is about breaking it down and give you guys the right information to then go talk to your doctors. Find your truths. But get the truth from us because we're not trying to, we're, we, we're basically we're, we're trying to tell you guys what, we're, what medicine is all about, what health is all about, and we want to make sure that everybody has all the right resources for success. So guess what? I'm so excited. My panel is here today, and I'm going to introduce, to you, introduce them to you right now because they're just fantastic. So we've got my first guest. He is no longer a rookie on To Your Health with Dr. G. <laughs> He's a good friend of mine. He's been on the show before. He actually was on my opioid show. And I, and I advise you guys, if you want to find out more about that, go back on my website. The opioid show is on my website, www.drmarkgomez.com. Check it out. Dr. Hong had amazing insight at that time. So again, I'm so excited to welcome him back. So let me introduce Dr. Hong because his credentials are deep. Hold on, my friend. Here we go. <clears throat> Dr. John Hong, double board certified in pain management and anesthesiology founder and president of Gateway Spine and Pain Physicians. Check him out, www.gatewaypain.com. Dr. Han, welcome back to the show. Dr. G, great to be back. Thanks for inviting me back. Hey, you bet. Hey, you know, when we were coming to the show, I was like, I got to get you on the show. Yeah. And, and I was so impressed by what you did the last time on the opioid show. So welcome back. Please tell us about, please tell us about 
where you do your medical school, where you do your training, and kind of what, uh, maybe an opening statement of what anesthesiology means to you. Yeah, great. Um, I did my medical school training at Tufts University in Boston, and then um, I came out to the great Midwest here for um, after a surgery internship, and I came out here uh, for anesthesia residency at uh, Rush University Medical Center. Um, that was uh, three years, and then after that, um, I went on to a pain medicine fellowship at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Okay. And yeah, I've been in private practice ever since. Um, my area of focus is pain medicine, pain management. I um, really am not the, do the anesthesiologist in the operating room who's uh, putting people to sleep, uh, so it's, uh, I bring a different angle in terms of my experience as an anesthesiologist. And, for me, being an anesthesiologist as a pain specialist is really an opportunity to help patients that truly need care. Um, oftentimes these patients suffer from chronic debilitating pain, and i am uh, it's my honor to uh, use the skill set that I have to try to help them um, regain some quality of life and to remain functional. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming back, Dr. Allen. I tell you, what, Dr. Allen has seen a lot of patients of mine over the years. Uh, we've collaborated on a lot of different d different medical uh, topics. Uh, certainly, in the last show, but also, of course, today. But it's just been a great um, a, a great uh, professional and a great colleague uh, in helping my my patients manage their pain and get them back to enjoying their quality of life. And and make no mistake about Dr. Hong. He is a busy man, there's no doubt about that. I mean, your practice has been growing and it's been great to see some of this journey. And so I continue, want to continue to, to uh, uh, collaborate with you in the future, but thank you again for coming on the show. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, my next guest, she and I go way back. Uh, and she's a dear friend of mine, uh, Dr. Audrey Oware. Uh, I want to just give you a quick backstory on how I know her. So, so Dr. Oware and my wife were at undergrad together at University of Chicago. And I will give out a plug to me, myself, and, and Dr. Oari's sister were together at Washington University in St. Louis. And in the Gomez household, yeah, there's a little bit of conflict going on between my wife and I as far as who do our kids root for, University of Chicago or Washington University in St. Louis. Since I've got the mic, I'm going to have to say Washington <laughs> University in St. Louis, but Dr. Oari's about to have the mic in a second, so she went to University of Chicago. But uh, Dr. Oari is just an amazing individual. Her husband was on my pharmacist show. Check it out on my website. Um, and Dr. Awari has seen a ton of my patients. We work together at Edward Hospital, and she's just an amazing uh, person. She's an amazing anesthesiologist. So I want to welcome her to the show. Let me read her, read her, her quick credentials, because also her credentials run deep, too. Everybody's credentials run deep, uh, without a doubt, on the show. So Dr. Audrey Awari, she's a board-certified anesthesiologist. She specializes in cardiac anesthesia, and she's certified by the National Board of Echocardiography. She's with the group DuPage Valley Anesthesiologist LTD. Check her out, www.dupageanesthesia.com. Dr. Awari, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, so my background, I was born and raised in Chicago. Um, my family's from Ghana, West Africa, if you're wondering where my name comes from. I did most of my training here in Chicago at University of Chicago, so yes, University of Chicago is the bomb. Um, <laughs> but I did my undergraduate there, I did my residency, in, um, my medical school, sorry, and then my residency there. And then I went to University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia um, to do my cardiac anesthesia training. Um, so it's been a great journey for me. Obviously my specialty is cardiac, so I'm very passionate about that. Um, I feel very blessed to do what I do. I feel like it's an honor to take care of patients um, when they're extremely nervous or afraid about what's going to happen to them. Sometimes patients are even more afraid of the anesthesia than they are of the surgery. So I think it's a, an honor for us to care for patients and help them through a very difficult time, um, and it's an honor. Thank you, Dr. Warren, for coming on the show. We're going to talk a little bit about that and a little bit about um, trying to easing, easing concerns of patients as they go through surgery. My last guest, he and I have known each other since our days uh, in, at Loyola. We were both interns. Uh, I was down the internal medicine path. Dr. Michael O'Rourke was down the anesthesiology pathway. Uh, uh, Dr. O'Rourke's wife uh, was one of my uh, colleagues in the internal medicine program at Loyola University Medical Center. So we've known each other for a long time. So I want to introduce my good friend and colleague, Dr. Michael O'Rourke. I want to read his credentials. 
because he's also getting deep on the credentials. Dr. Michael O'Rourke, he's a board certified anesthesiologist. He's also associate professor of anesthesiology. He's a director of pre-surgical anesthesia screening clinic at Loyola Medicine. Check him out, www.loyolamedicine.org. Dr. O'Rourke, welcome to the show. Thanks, I'm excited to be here. Hey, please give us a little bit of your background where you did your medical school, your training, and also about what does esteem anesthesia mean to you? You're right. Um, I'm originally from Michigan. I did medical school at Michigan State University and then came to Loyola to do my uh, training in anesthesiology. And basically since that time, uh, I've been practicing, since I completed the training in anesthesiology, I've been an anesthesiologist at Loyola. And uh, I, I do a couple different, wear a couple different hats there. Uh, I do a lot of just work in the operating rooms, uh, anesthetizing patients. I'm also in charge, uh, I'm the medical director of our preoperative clinic where patients show up uh, days or weeks before their surgery to make sure they're optimized for surgery. And then I'm also a member of our acute pain service, which um, our, our goal is to use non-narcotic methods to give optimal pain control perioperatively for patients. So I do all those things at Loyola. Excellent. You would, you definitely are a jack of all trades, which is was great. But you have to where you're at from a, from an academic standpoint. So it's just amazing that you're here. So thank you again for coming out. And again, when you think about this panel, they're again as I said at the beginning, they're fierce uh, because they, they encompass uh, diversity amongst anesthesia. Again, not just putting you to sleep. There's so many different things we're going to talk about that. So. The clinical question, the question of the hour, things that we talk about, the chief complaint. Every week on the show, we always have the chief complaint, so here we go. The, th the thought of having an anesthesiologist as part of one's care team seems to cause unreasonable anxiety. So what are we doing to help educate patients that the role of an anesthesiologist is diverse and that they help ensure healthy living in the communities they serve? So that's kind of our question of the hour, again, what we're talking about. So we're going to get right into it. Uh, the great thing is that I get to ask all the questions. You guys get to answer all the questions, too. Uh, it's like, it's like uh, our days as medical students and residents going back in. But again, the point of today's show is to create awareness. And I want you guys to know that these individuals are here to help you out with your health care needs. They're, again, amazingly trained. They're skillful physicians, and again, I want to acknowledge that today. So I'm going to go ahead and ask the first question for Dr. Hong because he's sitting in the hot seat <laughs> next to me. But this is just more like a general question. Before we just dive into this, I just want to kind of get your general thoughts. You know, what are your thoughts about, like, just health right now going on? You know, you guys see things from an anesthesia standpoint. I see from an internal medicine standpoint. But, but, but what are your thoughts about just kind of the, the challenges that we face, the chronic disease, the bur burden uh, uh, in this country? Well, that's a broad question. Um, I like it broad. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as far as what I come across, I see a lot of chronic pain. And this is, in my opinion, uh, a profound problem in our society. Um, it's been uh, called the silent epidemic. Um, a lot of people suffer uh, with chronic pain, and they just don't feel like they have the answers, or nobody can really give them the answers that they, they need to just get their pain under control and have some quality of life. So that's that's one thing that I see. And then, of course, in this day and age, um, there's so much complexity and so much barriers within the, uh, the health system that sometimes doesn't allow patients to have good access to quality of care. Uh, and this may be finances, it may be um, insurance issues or lack thereof. Um, it may be um, just a lack of knowledge about you know, who to see um, when they're suffering with chronic pain because perhaps they've seen multiple different doctors that aren't necessarily pain specialists and have been told various information. So there's a, a host of challenges that in terms of just knowledge and also uh, access to good physicians that um, that I see as uh, barriers to good care. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. I mean, we're, we're all dealing with comp the complexity of patients. The reality is that we see a lot of rising disease burden. You just talked about chronic pain, the epidemic that's been going on. But you're thinking about still the rising disease burden that we all see, uh, diabetes, heart disease, the obesity epidemic. Uh, and, and, and we seem to be losing those battles. I think having a platform like this is a way to talk about it and hopefully we can come up with practical solutions where we're all caring for those kind of patients that are out there. And so we want to make sure that we try to do our due diligence, but we've all had to kind of evolve ourselves to be able to take care of 
the patients, and, and nothing's necessarily kind of cut and dry anymore. Uh, I know I certainly see it as an internist, and, and you know, yes, people may be living longer, but there's certainly more burden going on. Let me ask this question to Dr. Awari. So, so, so you're you're doing a lot uh, seeing your patients, of course, and, and again having a special uh, specialization with cardiac anesthesia. But but you're seeing the burdens of heart disease. You're you're seeing the fact that that people need to have open heart surgery. Uh, what's kind of your general thoughts on just like the the lifestyle and the chronic disease burden that we're facing in this country? Um, well, it is challenging. Um just because we do see patients with so many diseases, as you've, me as you've mentioned, diabetes, kidney disease, diabetes, kidney disease, uh, heart disease. So it's very challenging. And, you know, we see the end of it when patients are in the operating room needing surgery, and then we have to deal with all those comorbidities and those illnesses. But if, I think if we work from a more preventative stance and patients having an understanding of how their lifestyle affects their body and causes illnesses potentially. How smoking can cause, you know, problems down the line or how what we eat can cause problems down the line or lack of exercise. It all contributes to problems that now when you become ill, then that makes your care that more, much more challenging. So if we can start more as a preventative mechanism to help patients kind of understand, that will really help you further down the line. Excellent. You know, Mike, I want to I ask you this question because you're really involved on, the, on really the, the, the pre-surgical uh, side of things, also educating uh, and teaching the next generation of anesthesiologists. How do you kind of see things? I mean, you see people at their, vulner at their most vulnerable before they're getting ready to have an operation, but you're seeing the disease burden. How do you kind of just kind of address that, or how do you just think of any, are there any other practical solutions that we could be doing out there? Uh, not to say that people can't, you know, we, we want to, you know, I, I've talked to a doc before, and he goes, I want to be, I want to do so well with preventative medicine that I actually want to be put out of business. Uh, uh, so that's, that's a very cool. interesting thing. But, but you're still seeing the, the chronic disease burden. So how are you educating the, the next generation or even some of your colleagues on how to deal with more, more of these com complex patients? Yeah, I guess I think about that two ways. One, in the role of the, the pre-op clinic, the goal is to optimize patients. So we see, we see a, a wide variety of patients with medical problems. Some uh, are very good at follow-up with their PCPs and they show up for surgery and really it's, they're, they're basically ready to go as soon as they walk in the door. We see other people that have a surgical issue, and this is their first contact with the healthcare system in five years, ten years, maybe you know their whole life. And those people, it can be a real challenge if you show up, say, a week to three weeks before a major cancer surgery or other surgery, and you've really had no healthcare, uh, you know, for your life. So, um, it, for my role in the pre-op clinic, it's uh, it's very interesting just to see those differences between people. And we really, tr you know, the goal of the clinic is to really get things under control as quickly as possible. And we really rely on other folks like our internist colleagues to help us with that to make that happen. And as far as like addressing that, so part of my role also at the academic center is uh, we have a group of residents and also medical students within our department. And so part of my role there is to educate them about anesthesiologists really need to be um, well versed in all body systems because a lot of that uh, affects your perioperative care. The heart, the lungs are the core of what we do, but also many other body systems. So there really is a large wealth of knowledge that you need to pass on to the next generation for, um, for just general knowledge so that they can get the best possible perioperative care. Thank you. You know, I think about just the, you know, you're speaking, you guys are speaking my language, even though you are all specialists in what you do in your craft, a lot of the themes uh, hold true throughout medicine, even for me as a primary care doctor, because again, you guys are seeing a lot of the things that I'll see. You're seeing them maybe in, in a narrow window, but you guys can all look very broadly at the care of the patient. And so I think that's great that we can have some collaboration, and hopefully as we continue to collaborate, we're able to move the needle and, and, and make differences in people's lives. Uh, of course, from an anesthesia standpoint, you know, we think about we want to get people successfully through their surgery and everything. I want to take a step back, because we all know about anesthesiology, uh, but I want to take a, back, take a step back about what are kind of the origins of anesthesiology. So I'm going to ask this question to Dr. Oware. Uh, <laughs> what are some of the origins of anesthesia? Like, how did we get there? You know, I think of like the old, the old images that we see in, in old, uh, you know, historical movies, and you know, somebody with a, a some ether and a, and a and a napkin, or somebody, uh, you know, getting having some drinks, and then you know, tell them to bite on a 
on a, on a belt, and then you kind of go from there. But what are some of the origins of, like, I'd probably say more like modern anesthesia? Right, so anesthesia has been around uh, for centuries. Um, in the 1800s is really when anesthesia really started to take off. And it was actually when anesthesia was first described as a specialty to help um, render a patient unconscious and not feel pain. Um, in the 1900s, and so in the 1800s when they had things like chloroform and the ether, but in the 1900s was when most of our IV anesthetic drugs, our inhalational anesthetic drugs, um, our local anesthetics that we use for regional anesthesia that Dr. Hong uses, um, and our muscle relaxants, our muscle relaxants are actually developed in the 1900s. So that's really when it took off and a lot of the advancements in anesthesia came. Excellent. Well, thank you for that historical perspective. And, and, and I, I, we always talk about innovation, and we've had to have innovation in medicine to go from you know, the days of chloroform and ether to where we're at now, obviously it took innovation, and it took refining of techniques. Um, so let me ask this kind of question. I'll ask this question to, to Dr. Hong. Um, you know, and, and even though you, you know you practice medicine, your practice scope is really more chronic pain management, but you're still using anesthesia, uh, certainly for your regional type procedures. So what are some of the kind of like, you know, people ask me all the time, what are some of the side effects of anesthesia? Why don't we start out with like, you know, if you're going to do like a regional procedure, a nerve block, for example, um, what are the kind of things that people may expect? There are various types of injections that we do, um, either to numb nerves or to burn nerves to stop the transmission of pain. Um, we're also using um, various medications like local anesthetics and steroids to reduce inflammation. So what's important to point out is there's not just one single type of injection. People oftentimes come to see, see me and said, I had a back injection. And I'm like, well, that's kind of like saying I had surgery. So I, there are many different types of injections. So what to expect varies depending on the type of procedure being performed. But in general, um, these are image guided injections that are done very quickly, typically within about five minutes or so. Um, they're not typically that painful, although pain is something that varies quite substantially individual to individual. Um, but we typically uh, do these procedures very safely and effectively. And oftentimes they're done not only to treat the patient from a therapeutic point of view, but we're also using them to establish a diagnosis. Excellent. Let me ask this question to Dr. O'Rourke. Um, you know, one of the things that I know we were doing some pre-show prep, you and I were talking, uh, getting ready, but you know, when, when I think about like, my patients, I'll see some patients and, and they'll be like, hey, you know what, I'm an, I, you know, I tell them, I'm an internist, but I think this is what's going on. And you know, you're probably gonna need to see a specialist and you're probably gonna need surgery. And, um, and, it, and the reality is that, like, I, don't, I feel like some people don't mind the surgery, but then the question that is asked to me right away is, so am I going to have to get anesthesia? And then I tell them, you know, for example, surgery, I'm like, okay, it's probably your gallbladder you're going to need, your gallbladder taken out. Uh, and I go, absolutely, you're going to need anesthesia. You don't want to remember any of that. Uh, but then they're like, oh, no, like, like, you know, is there another way? You know, so how do you kind of start, start that conversation of the ease of just guiding the patients and, making, and telling them that, Things are going to be, we follow these protocols, these are, this is going to be very safe. But how do you kind of have that conversation to ease the anxiety in patients? Yeah, I think, I think one thing to recognize is, as we were talking about the history of anesthesia, I mean, when, if you were having an anesthetic in the 1800s, it, it was uh, an inexact thing. Uh, modern anesthesia is quite different from that, and it's very, very safe. Um, so when we're practicing, typically we're, we're giving modern agents and we're doing them based on a lot of things, uh, your, your comorbidities and, and your age and your weight. And uh, generally, anesthetic uh, in the United States currently is, is a, it's a very safe process. Um, complications can occur, but they're, they're very rare. Um, as far as, so I, I start with that. Um, and it's interesting because typically we don't often meet our patients before the day of surgery. When they're shown up, they haven't eaten anything, sometimes they're in discomfort because of the procedure that they're going to have, like their knee is sore before their knee surgery, and they're very anxious because I haven't eaten anything, I haven't had my coffee, my knee hurts, and now I'm here and I'm meeting you and I'm in this gown and I'm cold, and it can be kind of an anxiety provoking, uh, provoking hearing. So, our job as anesthesiologists kind of is to put the patient at ease, talk about the steps that we'll go through, and 
we do that depending on the anesthetic. If you're going to have the general anesthetic, just talk about just the general steps for that. If you're going to have a regional anesthetic, just talk about the general steps of that. So there's no surprises from when we leave the preoperative holding area. At my, at my institution, you're there with your family. We go to the operating room. There's no surprises. Do the anesthetic and then, you know, uh, talk again when you're in the recovery room about, you know, how things went and what we can do to make you comfortable moving forward. So I guess one way to address that would be simply to say that, you know, currently, you know, in 2019, anesthetics are very safe. Um, it's a, and it's a very precise field that, you know, physicians like us train for years to do, um, to do, to do well. And it's something we take a lot of pride in. Let me come right back at you with another question. You know, you know, we're talking about obviously anesthesia, but you guys do so much more. Uh, you know, can you talk about like some of the things that you guys do in the operating room uh, besides just putting somebody to sleep? Yeah, for sure. Um, there's one thing that I do is a regional anesthetic, which is a way to control post-operative pain control. So, for example, if you are coming for a very common surgery like a knee surgery, uh, before the surgery happens, typically in the preoperative holding area, we inject uh, numbing medication in a couple of certain spots in your leg that reduces the amount of pain you have. And depending on the type of surgery, for instance, for a knee surgery, we inject medication that lasts from 24 to 72 hours. And the goal for that is when you wake up from surgery, you are more comfortable and, um, and you need less narcotics and other medications that have side effects so that a, you're more comfortable, and B, we can avoid opioids and other medications that have side effects. So we do that. Um, and just outside of the operating room, anesthesiologists have a lot of different roles as well. Um, we are critical care physicians, so um, you can get into critical care from a variety of medical specialties, but anesthesiologists are typically physicians and staff critical care units, and then we're also um, very commonly in, uh, in pain clinics like Dr. Hump. Dr. Awari, tell us a little bit more, you know, your experience as well, too, being in the, being in the operating room. You know, again, anesthesiologists do so much. Uh, a lot of people don't know that you guys control the airway uh, when we're talking about surgeries. You guys do the intubation. Uh, so you guys try to get access um, um, for IV access. So talk a little bit about, about more about some of the things and expound on what, expand on what Dr. O'Rourke uh, says. Right. So, I mean, even starting in the preoperative period, um, part of our assessment, in addition to getting the patient's history and doing a physical exam, the physical exam, um, one thing that we do differently from other doctors is looking at the airway. So we can look in the mouth and see um, patient's anatomy, such as their uvula, and predict you know, what it'll be like to put the breathing tube in the patient. It's a prediction to see the ease of putting in the breathing tube. So if you are having a general, you'll have a breathing tube placed for certain type of surgeries like abdominal surgery. Well, there's other types of surgery that you can do under sedation or monitored anesthesia care. Um, there's other, he mentioned regional anesthetic, um, there's epidural anesthesia, there's spinal anesthesia, so there's many different things that we do in the operating room, but also, as he says, you're also thinking about what's going to happen post-op, for post-operative pain. So we're actually planning for, you know, taking care of the patient intra-op, but also what's going to happen when the patient is done. How are we going to prevent their nausea? So we give them anti-nausea medications while they're asleep because we know that nausea is a known side effect from having opioids given or some of the inhaled anesthetic agents. So there's a lot that goes into it, you know, from preoperative to post-op. So we're kind of thinking of all of that um, from the beginning of the case to the end. Excellent. And I, and I think really about, you know, I've, I've had some surgeries done in my life and and I mean, my, the anesthesiologists that I've had are, have been just amazing. And the ways that you guys are describing it today was exactly my experiences. I know everybody has, may, may, may have a little different experience, but the experiences, it should be very standard, uh, very uniform as far as, you know, for that particular procedure. If it's a different procedure, obviously there's some different protocols that go, but, but from the start to the finish of your day, uh, it should be transparent uh, as far as the communication between your anesthesiologist and yourself uh, and your family. Uh, but also guiding you to get you through a successful surgery because as Dr. O'Rourke said, you know, there's a lot of anxiety on the day of surgery. And there's no, no doubt. And I think the anxiety of a lot of it is because, you know, somebody's been suffering for a long time from an ailment, but they also care. They want to get better. I truly believe that people, when they go have a procedure done, they want to do something that's going to, they've been advised from their physician to do something that will give them a positive outcome. And so, um, and so they're there to help you out 
and those kind of things. I want to ask Dr. Holland this question because, again, I want to really paint this picture again, the anesthesiologist, and I want to go back to a little bit more of the training that's required. So can you just describe, Dr. Holland, the, the, um, uh, the, how long the residency program, the residency, residency program is for anesthesia? What kind of fields are you guys doing? Uh, is it when, when I know you might start more broad, but you might get more narrow focused as you get towards the end of, of residency. But can you describe just a general appreciation out there for anesthesia residency? Sure. Well, after medical school, uh, we do a one year uh, internship, and that can be in various uh, disciplines such as medicine or surgery. I myself did a surgical internship, and then after that, there is a residency for anesthesia, which is typically three years long. And um, it's a progressive training, of course. Um, you start off being supervised, but then by the end of your residency, you're very proficient. You have quite a few number of cases under your belt. And um, during the residency, um, you can think about specializing or not specializing. And there are various uh, subspecialties of anesthesia, including cardiac anesthesia, pediatric anesthesia, and uh, pain management, which is what I wanted to Excellent. So let me ask you guys this question. <clears throat> so I want to change the themes a little bit, uh, and I want to go back to some, some again general kind of themes. I just want to just get a couple more locked in descriptions. Um, can Dr. Dr. Owari, can you explain the difference between general anesthesia and regional anesthesia, and then maybe we'll talk about what spinal anesthesia is. But can we talk about some of the differences so people out there can understand uh, the approaches that they may be offered based on their particular situation? Okay. That's a really good question. Um, so general anesthesia is when the patient is rendered completely unconscious, no idea what's going on. Um, most general anesthetics, they do, we do place a breathing tube. Um, so if you're having bowel surgery, you can't be breathing on your own. So we will place a breathing tube, put you on a ventilator, and monitor you and make sure that you're safe. Um, again, monitor sedation is maybe if you're having like, um, a bunion surgery or a carpal tunnel or something, then you can give IV sedation to make the patient fall asleep. However, they are breathing on their own. There's no breathing tube. They just might have some extra oxygen given through a nasal cannula in their nose or an oxygen mask. Regional anesthesia, is, as he mentioned, was where you get, say if you're having orthopedic surgery like knee surgery, as he mentioned, you're just getting local anesthetic placed around the nerve, and so it's causing numbness to the extremity that you're having surgery. Um, and that really helps for the post-op period, like he mentioned. Um, epidural or spinal is also known as neuraxial anesthesia, where you're getting local anesthetic either placed in the epidural space or in, in the CSF, in the cerebral spinal fluid. So you're creating numbness um, from the area that you, pretty much the area that you inject down below. Um, and so that's really helpful, for example, if you're having a baby, obviously, to not feel the contractions, or if you're having hip or a knee surgery that's used in conjunction with the regional nerve block that he mentioned. Excellent. Well, thank you for that very nice description. And I hope that kind of clarifies things. You know, as, a, as an internist, uh, you know, certainly we have a lot of our patients that go through your guys' doors. And, and not only does it help me just understand more, because every day, I, I truly believe every day is an opportunity to learn something. And I challenge everybody to learn something every day. Uh, but also to work on yourself, too. So as I'm hearing what you guys are saying, I keep thinking, now how can I apply that kind of description to a patient of mine that I might be seeing tomorrow in the clinic who may be seeing me for a pre-op clearance who might ask that question. Because the reality is, is as, a, as a primary care doctor, I certainly get a lot, of, I, I get a lot of surgical questions asked to me, by the way. <laughs> and, and instead of me just saying, defer to your, you know, you should ask that question to your surgeon because you're going to have surgery next week. Uh, uh, but it gives me a more understanding, I ask that question to anesthesiologists, it gives me more of an understanding just to go. And I think for people out there that have heard Dr. Awari's description and the other docs <coughs> today, hopefully this helps kind of just ease things from your perspective. Uh, go ahead, Mike. If I might add one thing, um, a lot of times when I see people coming for smaller surgeries, they, they request, they say, I'm very nervous. I just want to be completely unconscious and not know what's going on. And it's important to know that, again, in 2019, you have a lot of different choices for your anesthetics. And there is mounting evidence that having, not having general anesthetic for certain types of procedures may be better. Um, so for instance, uh, knee and hip surgery, that at many centers is now being done under spinal anesthesia, sometimes exclusively. And um, luckily we have a clinic where people come to to discuss these things, but a lot of times that causes some anxiety when people show up on the day of surgery because they say, I thought I was going to be totally asleep. You say, well, I'm going to make sure that you're very comfortable, but this may be a better choice, and you can explain the, 
the side effects and the benefits, but it's important to speak, if you're scheduling surgery, it's important to speak with your surgeon if you have specific questions about an anest a future anesthetic, get a hold of the anesthesia team that will be that could be taking care of you in the future to discuss options because there's a lot of different options depending on the type of surgery you're having and general anesthetic though a good option for many for many types of uh, surgeries may not be the best option for every surgery so thank you for the clarification on that dr o'rourke i mean that just really helps people out there that are trying to get more information about what to expect and again the thing about us as, as humans and i think a lot of it was we we like a lot of control in our lives and, and sometimes, you know, we talk about uh, a situation like a surgery where you don't have the control, you're, you're, you're relinquishing that sense of self-control uh, um, over to your medical team. But this is why it's important to, to, for people to understand that your anesthesiologist is a very integral member of your medical team when you need the anesthesiologist to be. And so I think this is just very helpful information for people out there so they can make the best informed decisions that they can make about their health and going from there. So, you're, again, you're listening here right now, guys. You're listening to watch us on Facebook Live. You're listening here on NLXLradio.com. I want to change the topics a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about pain because, again, we're talking about anesthesia, and we're talking, and reality is we're talking about pain. Those two tend to go hand in hand. I want to ask Dr. Hong this question. How did, how did your specific specialty evolve out of just kind of general anesthesia to address the pain needs uh, of many, many people in this country? That's a great question. Um, the subspecialty of pain medicine naturally evolved from anesthesia. I mean, if you think about it, the whole idea of providing anesthesia is to reduce pain during surgery and also, of course, to change the consciousness level. But anesthesiologists for a very long time have managed patients' pain within the operating room and during surgical procedures and operations. Um, so. Over the span of the past 40 to 50 years, there's been um, anesthesiologists that have branched off and uh, specialized more and more, first in regional anesthesia. So as Dr. Everett mentioned, we're numbing nerves to anesthetize certain parts of the body. Uh, and then uh, more fully into pain medicine, which has really evolved into its own specialty. Pain is complex, you know, and it involves uh, an understanding of anatomy, physiology, psychology, psychiatry. And so, and the advanced, there's been quite a few advancements within the field itself. So the specialty itself has really evolved into its own discipline. Um, and uh, doctors like me that are anesthesiologists have many times branched fully into being dedicated to this subspecialty. And so, you know, I think about, there's so many countless different options that are out there, and Dr. O'Rourke mentioned earlier about the, the role of trying to avoid uh, the, the high hitter, the high power medicines, the narcotics, the opioids. You know, we think about pain medicine. I certainly think as a primary care doctor, I say, all right, you know, let's, let's start, you know, at basics, you know, Tylenol, if you're able to tolerate ibuprofen, if there's not any contraindications, uh, and then you kind of start from there. Uh, let me ask this question to Dr. Work. What's your kind of general approach when you're thinking about pain, um, and even as you advise the residents on how to manage pain, what's your kind of general approach on that? Yeah, the, the buzzword for this is multimodal analgesia, which means using a variety of different medications. And again, it depends on the type of surgery you're having. Um, if you're having a bunion surgery, you're probably just going to be on Tylenol with very minimal discomfort. If you're having a large abdominal surgery with a, with a large incision, you're going to be in the hospital for a couple of days and you're going to require um, different methods. So um, the first thing is what type of surgery are you having? And then the second thing would be we try to use a variety of medications, and in 2019, that means uh, a variety of non-opioid medications first, um, and that can include a variety of things. Regional anesthesia techniques like nerve blocks or epidurals. For an abdominal surgery, uh, an epidural, and now there's other regional techniques that can be used to numb the abdomen where you're having the incision. And then beyond that, medications from different drug classes, and there, there's a lot of different types of pain medication drugs uh, that are non-opioids and so typically for for any given surgery you would be on a variety of those medications depending on your medical history and the type of surgery you're having some of those are better than others and that's something that your 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 uh, the physicians on your care team when you're having surgery can help you make that decision but the big word is multimodal analgesia which means we're going to use a lot of different types of medications uh, and 
and regional anesthetic techniques to control your pain perioperatively. Thank you. You know, one of the things that I see as a, um, as a primary care doctor, one of the most common complaints why somebody comes into the office is for musculoskeletal disorders, musculoskeletal pain, knee pain, elbow pain, back pain, neck pain, you, you name it. That's probably the most common thing I see. And really, as a primary care doctor, I try to figure out how can I best address that uh, and try to use this multimodal uh, analgesia approach uh, and try to keep things simple. But also, I like to try to incorporate other techniques that are out there whether if it's just your knee, you know, maybe you need to go see a physical therapist. So I try to look for our allied health uh, colleagues uh, to see if they can help out chiropractic, acupuncture. And we just want to try to throw the whole kind of quote unquote kitchen sink at people to manage their pain in a very in, in a um, fast way, an expedited expedited way, but also to uh, avoid some of the narcotic ways of doing it. Um, you know, let me ask this question back at Dr. Hong. You know, some people may have gone through that whole kind of thing that I just just laid out. They've done the medical doctor, they've done the allied health specialist, and then they have to kind of get to that point where they say, well, my only option is maybe narcotics. How do you kind of just evaluate that? There's a, a lot of concern these days about narcotics or opioids, and uh, there was a period of time uh, not too long ago where we really prescribed a bunch of opioids, and uh, there's a growing awareness of just the, the lack of efficacy long-term, as well as the risks associated with opioids. And so our, um, our goal here is when we have a patient that is not improving with those um, first-line treatments like physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, rest, um, we, we as pain specialists want to evaluate them and determine exactly the source of their pain and figure out what we can offer them to address their pain quickly because my concern as a pain specialist is when acute pain becomes chronic because chronic pain leads to disability on all levels, psychologically, socially, physically. Uh, so I want to try to short circuit that downward cycle of pain as quickly as possible. Thank you. I know one of the things that a lot of people ask me now is the, the rise of medical cannabis. And this show is not medical cannabis. I may do one in the future, who knows? But but again, um, that's another option that people are coming out. Uh, I'm not saying I'm for, for, for or for against, but I can say this, no major medical organization has come out and endorsed medical cannabis uh, as a mode of treatment for chronic pain. Who knows what, what the data may show uh, down the road, but again, no major medical organizations come out, at least uh, that, I, that I'm aware of. I know the American Board of Internal Medicine has not come out. I don't know if the American, uh, American uh, Society of Anesthesiology says, has made a statement. Are any of you guys aware of that? I don't think they've made a statement regarding this. It's interesting, politically, in the state of Illinois, there really, there's actually a, a new act that was passed called the Illinois Opioid Alternative Act that was just rolled out, and they, they're saying that anybody who is currently using opioids or is a potential candidate for opioids can now qualify for a medical cannabis card. So there's a lot of, it's an interesting time that we live in regarding the cannabis issue because there is some evidence that it can help with, can, with uh, pain issues, and uh, my hope is that over time we'll, we'll validate that better one way or the other. Yes, exactly. Well, what I want to do with this now, I want to make a transition to uh, our myth versus fact section, something that I do all the time on the show, and really to set this record straight at the beginning of the show, I was talking about the reason why I wanted to create Two Year Health with Dr. G is to help not only eliminate some barriers, uh, but also to dispel some myths. And we're again talking about building trust and delivering truth. So I'm going to ask this question: mean, myth versus facts. How it works? Super simple, uh, kind of more like rapid fire. I'm going to say a statement, and then my panelist is going to maybe give a, a statement or two back on what they think it is. You know, maybe myth, maybe fact, but we're really, or maybe both. I've had some cases here, some statements that I've done on this show, and it's been both. Uh, but uh, but I want to just try to set the record straight to get people information out there so they can talk to their doctors and find ways forward in their healthcare. So the first statement goes to Dr. Owari. Here we go. Myth versus fact. Here we go. Here's a statement. If there is a dosage miscalculation, anesthesia can wear off before surgery is over. Um. That is a fact. Um, if you don't give enough anesthesia, then absolutely it, it can wear off. And then, you, you know, depending on the drug, then you have to give more. Um, as mentioned before, we give our drugs, it's weight-based. Um, so if for some reason you don't have the correct weight or if you didn't give enough, it can wear off before. A lot of our drugs are meant to wear off at, with time, and, some, and then a lot of our drugs can be reversed. So that's obviously the plan for anesthesia to wear off eventually or to be reversed. 
But if you don't give enough anesthesia, then it can wear off earlier than you want it to, and then you'll have to give more. This is why you guys are so skilled at what you guys do to make sure that we have the positive outcomes that we want our patients. Here's the next statement. This is for Dr. O'Rourke. Here we go. Myth versus fact. The anesthesia version. Here we go. Anesthesiologists leave the operating room after the surgery begins. That's generally a myth. Um, there's actually a couple different ways the anesthesiologists practice. Um, one that I'll be doing tomorrow is I'm, taking, I'm the one person in charge of the anesthesia for the patient. So I greet the patient, I take the patient to the operating room, I'm with them the entire uh, I'm with them for the entire surgery, and then I accompany them to the recovery room, and then I sign off to a nurse who will take care of them there. So um, that's a very common practice. I practice at an academic center with uh, residents and also with uh, certified registered nurse anesthetists. That's called a care team model, which is another common uh, practice in the United States. In that scenario, I work with a resident or a CRNA, and in that scenario, the two of us are typically in the room putting the patient to sleep and then at some point after the patient has been anesthetized, typically after the surgery has started, I may in fact leave the room, but I'm leaving the room not with no one taking care of the patient. I'm leaving it with another uh, competent anesthesia provider with the patient taking care of the patient. And in that scenario, typically, I, um, I take care of more than one patient at the same time. I'm in the operating room for all critical periods uh, of the surgery, but I'm not there necessarily the entire time. But the only time you would leave the room is if someone else is there taking care of the patient. Thank you for the clarification. Here we go, Dr. Hong, myth versus facts. Here we go, here's a statement. Patient comorbidity is an important factor in determining the outcome of surgery. I would say that's true. All right. um, you know, patients uh, come to you with all different types of risk factors and illnesses and uh, surgery can be I mean surgery can be emergent it can be elective uh, surgery itself is a stress upon the, the body and so depending on how you're going into the surgery uh, weighs into the risk overall and how you're going to fare during the surgery and afterwards. All right, thank you. Here we go Dr. Warren, myth versus facts. Here we go. Here's a statement. Anesthesia can block your memory. Well that is a fact because there are certain types of drugs that we use that can block the memory. Obviously, we don't want the patient to be awake, so if you're doing a general anesthetic, they're not going to remember the surgery. Um, but certain drugs that we use, certain anti-anxiety drugs, versus being a common one, um, can cause some amnesia. I've had it myself before a surgery, and I'm like, I know, you know, they gave it to me in pre-op, and I know I was awake until I went into the operating room and they got all the monitors on, but I don't remember any of that. So I did have some amnesia, even though I was awake before they actually put me to sleep in the operating room. So that is okay. Oh, yeah. I've been, I've been in those <laughs> shoes, too. And it's like, oh, all right. Next thing I know, I'm in the, yeah. I'm in the recovery room. All right, yeah. then. There we go. Here we go. Myth versus fact. We'll do a couple more of these. Here we go. Dr. O'Rourke. Here we go. Myth versus fact. People who are smokers may need more anesthesia than do non-smokers. I, it, de it depends. Uh, I'm going to say that's a, generally a myth, um, but it depends on the type of anesthetic we're talking about. But generally, sm there are risks of anesthetic associated with smokers, but generally, for especially for IV anesthetics, the dose is typically the same. And so, you know, it's interesting, I want to piggyback on that. You know, you mentioned earlier that, you know, there's so many different types of anesthesia when it comes to surgery and, and so many things that are just not general anesthesia. You know, I think as, as, my, as in my patients that are smokers, I think of suddenly like irritated airways and if that could be an issue, certainly when you're going to go ahead and um, certainly obviously intubate the patient if you have to intubate them. But if you're talking about obviously the IV anesthesia or something like that, this may not be, it might be a moot point. Yeah, but there's definitely, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you see someone I, you can tell how long someone's been smoking when you're taking care of them and when you're bracing and removing a breathing tube. Someone in their 20s who smokes, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, um, you, see that. you should stop smoking. Everyone should stop smoking right now. <laughs> and there you go. And I should reference, uh, I did a show on lung cancer, so certainly go back to that on my website, www.drmarkholmes.com. We'll do a couple more of these. Here we go, Dr. Hong. Here we go. Here's a statement. Chronic pain is a normal part of aging. Well, it is true, statistically, that as you age, um, things tend to wear out. And uh, 
as a result, um, joints can get painful, muscles get painful. But we don't have to go down without a fight. And we, I, I treat quite a few aging elderly patients that, that are otherwise healthy, that want to stay active. And, and if you are burdened by pain and you get less active, it really has a ripple effect on the, their whole state of health. So um, yes, pain does occur generally as you get older, but uh, in 2019, we have tools that can very effectively treat pain so that um, aging individuals can remain active. Excellent. I'm going to throw this one to Dr. Owari. Here we go. You'll like me for this one. Anesthesiologists are critical members and key members of the patient's healthcare team. That is a fact. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one to you. Um, like I said, you know, anesthesia is a very complicated field. Um, Obviously, we're part of the care team. We communicate with our surgical colleagues to, you know, formulate a plan for the patient, communicate with the patient, you know, talking about comorbidities and what's the plan. Because, you know, even though most surgeries may require a general anesthetic, maybe if they have lung disease or, you know, heart disease, maybe they wouldn't tolerate the general anesthetic. You know, maybe a, a spinal might work better for those patients. So, again, um, there's a whole planning that goes into it, um, and we are partners with you as the patient, partners with the surgeons, and the whole surgical team, the nurses in the operating room. Um, it's like a well-old machine. I'm going to give one more. i got a bonus, myths versus facts, so I can even it out because everybody's got almost essentially the same amount of questions. So here we go. Dr. O'Rourke, here we go. I'm evening, trying to even this out. Here we go. This will be the last myth versus fact. Here we go. Dr. O'Rourke, statement. Spinal anesthesia causes back pain. It's, it's probably a myth. Um, it de there, there's actually a lot of concern about this regards to pregnant women having epidurals, which is similar. It's both a needle in your back. Um, so um, generally, it's a needle going into your back to do a spinal anesthetic or to do an epidural anesthetic. The big study that I'm aware about this was in, um, was in pregnant women who received epidurals. And um, they would, t sometimes women have back pain after after uh, labor and after carrying a child, which can cause uh, changes in the back. So basically they took uh, women who had an epidural and women that did not have an epidural and both had similar rates of back pain afterwards. So generally it does not. Um, there are other side effects of a spinal anesthetic and an epidural anesthetic, but generally chronic back pain is not typical. All right, well, thank you very much. There's Miss versus Facts Anesthesia, done and done. So we got just about five minutes left, guys. We're going to bring this on home. We talked about in the beginning the chief complaint talking about uh, creating more awareness in the role of anesthesiologists in one's healthcare team. Uh, we call it the assessment and plan. We kind of bring it on home. People come into the office and they leave with a diagnosis uh, and a treatment plan and, most importantly, a follow-up. So uh, let me start with Dr. O'Rourke, we're going to bring it on home. Just give us a couple take-home points today uh, that we're trying to do to create more awareness about anesthe anesthesiologists and anesthesia. What should people out there know about anesthesiologists? Sure. Uh, anesthesiologists are, we're, we're physicians and we're trained in the field of anesthesiology. And uh, though we can practice in a variety of fields like critical care, uh, chronic pain, there's a, the attorney general's an anesthesiologist right now, or sorry, the, attorney, the surgeon general's an anesthesiologist right now. Um, but generally, uh, most people are going to encounter us perioperatively when they're coming uh, when they're coming for surgery. And just know that um, we're physicians and we're trained in perioperative care, and we're there to help you be comfortable before your surgery, during your surgery, as well as after your surgery. Thank you, Dr. O'Rourke. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Dr. O'Rourke, give us a couple of take-home points about uh, creating more awareness between you guys as anesthesiologists and the general public at large. What are some take-home points? Um, some take-home points. Um, you know, patients are very afraid of anesthesia and not waking up um, or waking up during the surgery. Um, so, you know, obviously we've been trained for years to take care of the patient and ensure that they are, you know, stay asleep during the surgery, watch their blood pressure, heart rate, the hemodynamics, make sure that they're safe during the surgery, and of course, wake them up at the end of the <coughs> surgery. So that's definitely a concern that we have. That's why we're there. That's why we're there to help. Um, another question I get asked a lot is, are you going to use the Michael Jackson drug? But again, we are physicians. This drug is called propofol, not the Michael Jackson drug. But we've been trained to use it for years. Um, no, I'm not going to leave you while I'm giving you this medication, as you stated. Someone, a qualified anesthesia professional, will be taking care of you throughout the surgery. 
And, you know, we're very vested in our patients having positive outcomes and helping them through the surgical period. Thank you, Dr. Awari. It's been a pleasure for having you on the show. Dr. Hong, a couple of take-home points so for patients out there, people out there to know more about anesthesiologists. So there are anesthesiologists that practice out of, outside of the operating room um, that specialize in pain management. Um, the field is not as well recognized by the public, but we, we do exist, and um, we are passionate about uh, controlling pain and uh, restoring patients' well-being and function. Thank you again, Dr. Hahn, for coming back on my show, and look forward to some more collaboration in the future. Uh, and my take on points of this, uh, I've said this all along with the many guests on my show, uh, these individuals are just amazing uh, physicians. Uh, these are people that I know personally and professionally. Uh, they have your best interests in mind. They care about your health. And I want everybody to know that the anesthesiologist is an, ex is an exemplary person, and they're just there to help you not only get through your concerns that you have on your day of surgery or if you're getting a procedure done, uh, like what Dr. Hong does in his practice, but they're there to help make your quality of life better and just to continue to get you back into uh, great times with your family and your loved ones and living happy and productive lives. So I want to thank my guests today, Dr. John Hong, uh, double board certified in pain management and anesthesiology, founder and president of Gateway Spine and Pain Physicians. Check him out, www.gatewaypain.com. Dr. Audrey Oare, board certified anesthesiologist specializing in cardiac anesthesia, certified by the National Board of Echocardiography, DuPage Valley Anesthesiologist, LTD. Check her out at www.dupageanesthesia.com. And my good friend, known for a long time, Dr. Michael O'Rourke, Thank you, Dr. Ward, for coming on. Board certified anesthesiologist and associate professor of anesthesiology, director of pre-surgical anesthesia screening clinic, Loyola Medicine. Check them out at www.loyolamedicine.org. You've been listening and watching live on Facebook and intellectualradio.com. This episode is written by Mark D. Gomez, MD, and Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Producer is Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Music is by the wonderful Mr. Havis, my brother-in-law. He's a great, talented musician. Copyright 2019 by MDG Wellness LLC, all rights reserved. Stay tuned for my episode next week. We're going to be talking kidneys. The show is titled Conquering Chronic Kidney Disease. Peace out. <laughs>